Nicholas. You're on a roll, and I, don't, I just want to interject one thing before we go on to the next point, which is we were talking about payment for ecosystem services, uh, but that's really part of a broader discussion that's going on in the development community about conditional um, cash transfers and unconditional tra cash transfers. And there's interesting literature about this. Part of this debate is because, you know, there are international aid agencies that uh, distribute funds to Africa and Asia, uh, Latin America, and people have asked, well, is, is this really the best way to help people who are in poverty or to help countries develop? And uh, because often those kinds of projects involve paying expatriates to live overseas, buying expensive vehicles, uh, doing things for communities sometimes that may or may not seem to lead to development. So people have asked the question, well, what if we just took that money? Sorry, this is long. But, no, no, that's great. Uh, what if we just took that money and instead of, you know, investing it in vehicles and plane tickets and, you know, housing for people living outside their, their home countries, what if we just give it to people? Like literally give people several hundred dollars a year or a month or something. And the results of that research are kind of interesting because it turns out if you give a conditional cash transfer to somebody, uh, typically someone in poverty and not a lot of money, a few hundred dollars, that you find uh, that you can have them uh, have their children attend school more and that they can have better nutrition if you ask that to be one of the conditions of the cash transfer. Um, and so that's maybe not entirely unexpected. You can have somebody be willing to do something to get cash. But the more unusual thing is if you make it an unconditional cash transfer and you just give a family a small stipend for no, with no strings attached whatsoever, then you still find that their children tend to go farther in school and be better nourished, completely independent of asking people or telling people that that's what you want the cash to lead to. So there are some interesting outcomes that can, can come out of cash transfers and so one of the questions with payment for ecosystem services is that so that would be the, the in the category of a conditional cash transfer because you put a condition on it you're doing something for the environment in, in regard to the cash transfer uh, but I just wanted to interject that because we talked a little about this yeah. this morning when yeah. you weren't here about trying to link uh, development initiatives and achieve conservation outcomes and this is certainly one of the discussions that's going on in the literature now it, largely in the wake of not very successful efforts to do this in ICDPs and other yeah. projects. Great point and, and that follows with um, yeah I'll come to Fikrat in a minute it comes to the lies of fair approach right which is that people know best what to do with money right and we've seen different strategies being deployed and with different outcomes, but this research certainly looks quite promising. Yeah. Um, the key question I would have is that, how do you make sure that doesn't lead to a dependency relationship? So. Fikret. Okay, uh, maybe I'm confused or, I don't know. With, with a conditional payment to people, but wouldn't that somehow create a shift to you know, new areas to be exploited? Like, uh, you're paying them to protect, to conserve a forest, but uh, if they shift the pressure to a low productive area, or if they start exploiting a new area, then aren't we just shifting the pressure? Right, well then. <laughs> I'm getting so much exercise, this is great. Yeah, that's a very good question, because I think that comes back to the question of linkage. So uh, I was just kind of relating what's been seen in some of the development literature, uh, but if you look at Paul Ferraro's work, as we talked about this morning a little bit, trying to link specific uh, conservation actions or outcomes to uh, specific programs, then you might well ask of these programs, you know, people can do anything they want with the money. That may have beneficial personal or developmental outcomes, but if you're trying to achieve a conservation goal, you might want to find that in fact you're just pushing you know, pressure somewhere else. And uh, so I don't think there's a right answer to that, but that's a right. very good point. And all of this is coming to the issue we have at hand, which is that if you thought com conservation was complex before, <laughs> it's actually way more complex, which again has to come back to the fact that we need to expand our theoretical and methodological toolkits to understand this level of complexity, right? Um, what do I personally think works best? I don't know. I think, it's, I think it is completely 
dependent upon local histories, local complexities, the adequate consideration of both complex ecologies as well as complex social environments. Right? You cannot do one without the other. Which is an argument for, in my point of view, and I'm sure people will disagree, and I welcome that, is to incorporate more social sciences into conservation training, which is one of the things we're trying to do in this course. So, I, so one, of the, one of the ways is that people are often very, very, they don't want to move forward with new conservation initiatives unless they have aired their historical grievances and they've worked on this. The second one is to move beyond the nature culture binaries, because I think that's put us in a lot of problems in the first place. Um, enhancing communication, like I said, it's not just about translation, but it is about an understanding, right? And sometimes we tend to rely primarily on voice or text as the main way of communicating, and I think we need to go beyond that. There are subtleties in communication that we need to understand. Um, again, I'll make a ploy for long-term and continued place-based learning and research. It's not until you've sort of been in these places for a long period of time that you tend to understand these complexities. Um, this one is one that has been uh, used a lot, which is engage communities in research, in, in research. But what exactly do we mean by engage? Do you have members of local communities employed simply as research assistants so that they understand what the research is about or the importance of conservation? And one argument I can do here, which is quite dominant within the literature, is this idea of citizen science, which is you take citizens, whether they're from the local area or from abroad, and engage them as part of the learning experience. Now, not research, but the learning experience as a whole. Okay. And there are things we can learn from them about their encounters as much as there is stuff that we, they can learn from us as experts or scholars in the field. Um, now, this is only one w part of the cycle, which is to actually go back and present your research back to communities. I think this is super important because we might think that we've gone to a place, we've done research for 18 months, oh, I know everything there is to know now. And then you take your, your science and your results and you go and present it to the local communities and they go, well, that's not what we meant, right? And so that's a critical part of research that I think we need to continue to deploy. And then finally, to merge social complexity with ecological complexity, okay? And I'll stop there. Thank you.